Hello, everybody. It's 5.35 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 31st day of January 2018, I'm told. Today I'm going to be trying to illustrate the concepts that I brought up in yesterday's Daily Offerings video. The reason I didn't just do this yesterday is because uh, it's, ju it's just typical. This subject, amongst many subjects, let's say many revisionist s subjects, it's, it's pretty wide. And y you're dealing with a whole lot of various uh, factors that you have to look at. Uh, for instance, uh, one that's, uh, I mean, would be worth a paper in and of itself would be, say, the, uh, the travels of the patriarchs, Abram, Isaac, Jacob. Because those in and of themselves are very interesting. Uh, they're very telling. I'll, I'll tell you this. That it, here's one thing uh, before I even start. How about <clears throat> the fact that... Now, everybody thinks that... Uh, for instance, that Abiram, and I'm just pronouncing it the way that I've learned these uh, characters, uh, the way I believe they should be pronounced. So, we're told that Abiram, his wife Cherie, and his son, uh, I'm sorry, his nephew, Lute, all left... Um, his, you know, his father's house. And we kind of imagine him being in, in Ur of the Chaldees. And Ur is just a city. He's in the city. Anyways, and the Hebrew word for Chaldees isn't Chaldees either. I, I don't know where they come up with these fantastic transliterations and translations, but... Uh, I'm thinking um, possibly the pits of hell, but I could be wrong. So, we're to believe that he had left his father's house in Ur of the Chaldees, which they, they say is in this area here, that they call Mesopotamia, which has an, an entirely different name, by the way, in the Bible. We might get to that. I don't know. And um, so he leaves here. And they say that he goes, uh, that goes over here. Well, if, if you read Genesis closely, you'll see actually that uh, Abiram, Sheree, Lut, his father, um, they, they all head to a land that is eventually um, the same name as his brother. The thing is, and I, I probably just need to open up Genesis. It's a little difficult to <clears throat> search once I'm recording because my computer is, is broken in many ways. And that's the way it goes when you pour. Um, so, it might be in 12. Hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Go forward. Go forward. Mm-hmm. Sorry. I'm just... I'm, I'm pre-reading this, so I don't... Uh... Okay. So I, th I think I have to... Yeah, I gotta go back. Sorry. I think it'd be at the uh, end of 11. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Sorry. So, yeah, they uh, they go through uh, the lineage of uh, Shem after the Tower of Babel story is told in Genesis 11. And uh, in 1127, uh, yeah, sure. Now, these are the generations of Therah. Therah begat Abram. Neur and 
Aaron, and <laughs> Aaron begat Lut. And Aaron died before his father Thura in the land of his nativity in Aur of the Kushdim, the Kushdim. Not the Chaldees, it's Kushdim. All right. And Abram and Naur took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Shuri, and the name of Naur's wife, Milka, which is funny because that's also the uh, word for queen, uh, the daughter of Aaron, the father of Milka, and the father of Yiska. Um, but Shuri was barren, she had no child. Now, and Thura took Abram, right? Thura is Abram's father. Thura took Abram, his son, and Lut, the son of Aaron, his son's son, and Shuri, his daughter in law, his son. Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Aur of the Kashdim to go into the land of Canaan. That pause is just to soak in what I just read. Abram's father, Thura, he took Abram, Lut, Shuri, his daughter-in-law, and they went forth with them from Eur of the Kashdim to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. So actually, it's not so. I, I apologize. All right. Uh, Abram's brother was Eren. They came to the land of Haren. My bad. And the days of Thura were 205 years, and Thura died in Haren. They had set off. They had set off from Aur of the Kashdim, which is usually called Ur of the Chaldees, to go into the land of Canaan. See, everybody gets this idea when they're told the story of Abram that Yahweh told him to go to this land that was maybe not the first place that you'd want to go. But Yahweh had a plan. So Abraham listened, even though that's probably not the first place you'd want to go. I mean, that's the impression I got when I was first told these stories. If I remember right, that's the impression you get from that uh, big TBS movie they made like 20 years ago um, about Abraham. Uh, TBS made like a series of movies about the patriarchs. And even in that, we're given this impression that Yahweh is calling Abiram to go to Canaan, a place that he really wouldn't have chosen. But that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems that Thera, his father, decided to take Abiram, his wife Sheree, his son's son Lut, and go to Canaan already. And on their journey, they obviously had to go to 
this place called Haran. And apparently, Thura died in Haran. And right after it says that uh, his days were 205 years, and Thura died in Haran, then it says, Now Yahweh said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you. Well, hmm. What are we to believe? Are we to believe that they were all in um, Aur, and he told them that because a few verses down it says that he departed from Haran. That's where he was when Yahweh told him to leave that place, to get out of that place. They had obviously settled in, I mean, to one degree or another in Haran. I have heard so many bogus stories about Abram's calling. And we can see right here in the text that he was called when he was in Haran, and that his father, Thura, had intended to take them to Canaan anyways. They were going to go to Canaan, specifically. Now, okay, stay with me here. I'm going to go back to the map. So they say that they were living here in Ur the Chaldees. Now, I know, I know that there's uh, extra biblical literature and apocalyptic literature uh, like Jasher. Okay, I, I don't particularly know the, the source of Jasher. And to my knowledge, uh, no one has sufficiently proven that the Jasher that exists today was the Jasher mentioned a couple of different times uh, in the Old Testament. All right. So we're usually given this impression um, that they were dwelling uh, in, in this area uh, betwixt the Tigris. I, I bit my tongue there, sorry. <laughs> betwixt the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which is, you know, was supposed to be so lush and, and, and wonderful, and they leave there to go to Canaan. Now, remember, I, I told you yesterday that even with all the efforts of the kibbutzes since the, the 1940s, uh, uh, the land of Greater Palestine is still 50% desert. So if we're talking about <clears throat> the way that the land would be functioning um, naturally without all of the, the money and the time that these kibbutzes have put into making it agricultural because they they have to deceive everyone and, and and make it look as though they're fulfilling prophecy about making the valleys bud and bloom and all that stuff, right? All right. So how much was desert and not so usable before the kibbutzes? So you're telling me that uh, the uh, family of Thura and, and Abram and Shri and uh, Lut and uh, I think, you know, it sounds like because of, of later when Abram sends uh, Eliezer back to his father's house that his brother and wife, they're living there. So uh, they, they, they must have been there too. So when he says the, the, the father's house, they must have found something in Haran that they found uh, desirable. But their goal, their aim was Canaan. It's called Canaan. Today, we think of it as Palestine or is not real. 
Why would anyone trade what is supposed to be such a good, lush area to live? To go to a place that at that time, without the kibbutzes, would have had to have been at least, if not more, than half desert. Why would you make that your aim? You see, Yahweh hadn't called anyone to go anywhere. That was Thura's plan. And yeah, they got stopped in Haran. But they were going to go to Canon. Now, in the book of Jasher, if I remember this right, of course, they try to say that there were all kinds of problems with uh, Thura because he was uh, like the captain of Nimrod's uh, army and Abiram was causing all kinds of trouble with the uh, idols and uh, idol worship and everything. And they had to, to leave. Okay. They could have gone anywhere. I mean, if there were nations in other areas that w would be hostile to them, okay, all right, I'll give you that, that's fine. But obviously, they stopped in this place, Haran, and stayed there, at least until Thura died. But they were on their way to Canon because obviously they considered it a, a heck of a nice place to go and settle down. I'm telling you, I, I can't repeat this enough. I don't know, I don't know everything, but I, you know, I've read a lot about um, Greater Palestine and the Gaza Strip what all is considered that territory in Jordan and, and everything east of there. And, and to me, now this may not be to everybody, and I'll tell you something, there's a strange thing about somebody who's born in a place, even a place that's really kind of crummy to live, that they, they, they develop emotional bonds even with that, that place and that harsh environment, you know? It is. I'll give you that. And, I mean, obviously that's why the Palestinians um, love their home, right? Because it's their home. That's where they were born and raised. Me personally, if I was given a lot of choices, or even two choices, I don't think the first choice would ever be Palestine. Even if there wasn't all the, the crap going on that goes on there, I don't think I would choose that place to go and live. And the funny thing is, these days, they, they've they had to uh, create such a false narrative that people talk about the harshness of living in this area of greater Palestine, right? And... um. As you know, because it's this, this place of testing, you know, where, where Yahweh could test his people and all. But that's not what Yahweh himself says about it when he describes it. And I told you guys yesterday um, when I was in my truck driving to work that you should go to Deuteronomy uh, in chapter 8. And we can start in verse... Um, six. Why not? That's a good verse. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of Yahweh thy Elohim to walk in his ways and to fear him. For Yahweh thy Elohim brings you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat 
and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land wherein you shall eat bread without scarceness. You shall not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you may dig brass. And that, that word uh, being used for brass, which would be um, Nahashath, um, probably copper, probably, um, but I mean, maybe not. Uh, just because brass is actually a composite, copper is usually the base uh, that would make uh, various different kinds of um, metal composites depending on how much of any uh, given metal that you're mixing in or chemical you're mixing in. Okay. Anyways, he now he doesn't say that it's going to be a good land if I bless it. He says it's a good land. He says it's a land where you will eat bread without scarceness. He says that he is going to displace many nations in this land. Obviously, there are many nations there, staying there, not because they didn't have anywhere else to go, I mean, if we're to believe the popular narrative, right? I mean, so much of the earth wouldn't have even been like populated, sparsely, barely, barely populated. But they wanna, they wanna hang out there. In in Joshua and Judges, um, a number of these large cities are described like when uh, Caleb is given um, his inheritance around um, Habarun, Hebron, Habarun. Um, remember, it's said that he's given certain portions of it because it's described just like a European uh, castle or fortress where you would have a, a main um, area of commerce and military might and protection within the main walls of the keep and you would have uh, towers and buildings and everything that you need to to run this um, this I don't if you want to call it a city-state great anyways because they were all in a sense self-contained uh, they would have uh, hamlets all around them so these would be essentially suburbs of this greater fortress or keep that would be all around that would actually do farming the agriculture and, and all those things remember one of the items in the law which is good that uh, Yahweh gives to um, Israel before he brings them into the promised land. He tells them uh, certain animals not to keep within the city because of their dung and dirtiness that, that they would provide. He's giving them this very clean way to live and he's giving them the right way to live so that their lives will be long and good. And so that would have been exactly what is being meant. You would have the main keep with its walls, its towers for, for defense. And you would have to think that this main keep and its towers would have to see quite a long way whenever possible because it's going to be the job of those people within that main keep to protect all the people in the hamlets all around. Now it's said that between the land occupied by Yisrael and we'll say Yehuda, um, 
Benjamin. It said that there were I mean, more walled cities like that than I can even number right now off the top of my head. Well, they're not finding those everywhere. They, they claim to have found the remains of those city-states. They can't prove this. Biblical archaeology is not real archaeology. And I'm going to just throw Egyptology in there, and we can include... Um, we'll include uh, excavations of, say, things like Nineveh and Babylon in with biblical archaeology. I would encourage anybody to look into any of these sites or any finds at uh, any sites find out who it was that um, made these finds and then find out who they worked for because usually you're going to find that they were employed by somebody and I'll tell you what in the last couple hundred years because that's when all of these finds happened so um, nobody really cared about any of these places until the last 100 or 200 years. And then the people who cared happened to be either directly employed by some of the um, most affluent merchant outfits of the world. Or the, let's say, the universities um, that they were employed at happen to be direct servants of whatever state uh, they came from. When you consider archaeology in general and digs, they're expensive. And nobody pays for a dig for the betterment of mankind. So we'll have to get to individual digs um, as we go because there are a number of sites that should look a certain way or should be completely wiped off the map not something you could just dig up and we're gonna see if these places um, match up very well or not Keep in mind something else. I want to stress this. I really, 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 really want to stress this. So many of the names of these places that we've kind of uh, come to know as a certain thing, like, like for instance, um, Mesopotamia. Let, let me type that in into uh, Blue Letter Bible, okay? Because I'm pretty sure that Mesopotamia uh, occurs as a word in the King James. And we got to use King James because it's coded to Strong's. We've got to use Strong's not because it's a good um, concordance, but it's thorough. And most things available today are coded to Strong's. Now, here it is. And this is the only occurrence. Is this, uh, these two words. And... It appears oh, six, seven times. Yeah. To the city of Nahor. Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. So, they are trying to tell us then that Mesopotamia and the city of Nahor up here. So, Mesopotamia must have been just a big old, big old strip right here, okay? Okay. Well, I know that the word, the two words that, that underlie it, it's uh, Aram and Ner-im. Ner-im. The im is plural. And Ner, uh, we first see in Genesis 2, and it certainly seems to be waterways, possibly rivers. 
Okay. Well, um, so maybe that would make, you know, a, a good argument like here, where, where they do the short definition. Uh, they'll say, Aram Naharaim, Aram of the two rivers. Mm. Mm hmm. Okay. And then, so that's, that's Mesopotamia. Well, um, uh, that I am there at the end it doesn't signify two. It's just a pluralization. Okay. So uh, you have to presuppose two. And the other thing is, yeah, here they go, Aram. And then, of course, Aram, they have to, today, they have to say it's Syria. Well, we could go, and I'm not going to, but we could. We could go to Ram, the word Ram. And we're going to see just again and again and again and again and again that Ram is going to be used for a, a high place. Now, I don't know if we're necessarily talking about highlands, you know, like highlands of Scotland, you know, uh, uh, raised elevation areas, maybe very hilly, rolly, you know, quasi-mountainous. Or if we're talking about artificial high places. I'm not necessarily convinced one way or another, but I can tell you <clears throat> that that's how Ram's being used. Um... And I'm just going to get out my uh, my handwritten, handwritten list, my handwritten wrist. Um, we'll have to go to Aram. Where's my mouse? Okay. Now, if, I, if I'm guessing this right, it's going to be listed a number of times. And the greatest majority of its listing type is going to be exalted like is in high high or exalted so we'll go back one okay so it starts then here aram and they're going to tell us that that's syria aram is syria now you have aramun aram Un. Uh, when you see the suffix un, uh, it typically is sort of like a, um, they call it a diminutive. And kind of, yeah, almost like a smaller version of uh, the word that you see behind it. All right, Aramun. Funny enough, uh, Aramun is a citadel, palace, or fortress. Sounds to me like something high. Okay. Not high like Towley gets, but high in elevation. Now this is Aram Tsube. Ooh, probably the land of north east of Damascus. Probably. You get a lot of those in Strong's. Probably this, probably that we think could be stop thinking and believe you get a lot of those in there too so now this would be Arame oh exalted a thing or a person from from Syria do you guys see how the circular logic goes here I mean they haven't proved anything not a thing nothing but it's all circular it's like the strata layers right you know all right, uh, just like that one, uh, there's that atheist um, that did that. He's a um, Hispanic professor of something. I had his video up yesterday. I was going to play it, but I didn't make the uh, video at home yesterday. Again, Arami, we've got it as a language. Mm -hmm. Now this is Aram... Narim that we were just at, and they say is Aram of the two rivers. Aramni, one of the palace, a son of Saul. So they're going to have a, have a hard time proving that. 
So, what we're going to have to do is go to 7410. because there's only one occurrence of RAM, that's why, and it's somebody's name. But, see, they even recognize that its root is high or exalted. No, they can't prove that either, but they recognize that. And you're going to see why too, because when you see the roots here, now we start to get into reme. Now, the e eh can sort of feminize the word that comes before it, but it doesn't always do that. I found that the e eh at the end oftentimes can even change the tense or type of word, like verb to subject, subject verb thing, okay? Oh, they say that reme would be to cast, shoot, or hurl, to throw. I don't know about you, but when I throw things, I tend to throw them high. They arc to cast or throw, says again. And you can see the cross-references if you care to. Reme, height, or a high place, a place of illicit worship. Say what? Really? Ezekiel 16.24, and has made thee a high place in every street. Ezekiel 16.25, you have built thy high place. Hmm. And make thy high place. Oh, break down your high places. All from Ezekiel, too. Ezekiel's one of those few books that has so many words that are very specific just to that author. It's another thing that makes me believe that you have to know what these characters or icons mean and how they interrelate to one another. Because if you do, then you can quite easily build a word that is um, the most fitting for a specific context that maybe, say, no other author would build or use. Let's see, Rama Hill. But it's the name of cities and towns. I think, though, that the evidence, maggot or worm, has a cause or sign of decay. That's interesting, right? Neither was there any worm therein. It could mean lumps. I've, I've gone through this, and I remember hitting this one and thinking, maggot or worm? Um, yeah could mean lumps, and I believe that's the last one. It is. Now, well, now we'll go into, you know, Rem Un, and they say it's a pomegranate. They cannot prove that. Again, Rem Un is pomegranate. Can't prove it. You would go to um, Remuth. Again, heights. Um, the Uth at the end there is going to be a feminine plural. Okay, so they say heights here. Remuth again, height, lofty, stature. So you've seen enough to know that we're talking about heights. We're talking about things that are lofty in certain contexts when used with certain suffixes. It can mean tower, a citadel. So what gets translated as Mesopotamia is that a ram. Nerim. Now, I'll give that to you, that second word, some kind of waterways. But I just got this sneaking feeling that a ram, we're talking about somewhere high. And there ain't nothing high about Mesopotamia. Unless you think that Babylon and Nineveh are there. Then maybe you're high. But I just don't think it fits. I don't think travel times fit at all with uh, Jacob going back and forth. We'll see that. A lot of things don't fit. So, why would Thurah, Abram's father, and Abram and Sheri, it's Sheri, I promise, and Lut be headed? to Canon. doesn't say they have family there. And I really have to believe that they had a lot of 
choices. They weren't headed for Haran, but they stopped there. Now, they can't prove, back to the map, um, they can't prove that Haran's up here, by the way. They're just saying. They kind of have to because of travel. Because nobody's going to travel here, you see. Everybody would have to travel up the river and then back down this way. Everybody. Because nobody wants to travel in here. It's all desert. It's all desert. I, you know, I'm not trying to insult anybody, but this place is kind of sucks. It's not nice. So, <clears throat> Yahshua says at a certain point, that the Queen of Sheba would would judge um, you could say generation. A lot of people say it's it's a whole lot better to translate it as um, um, seed line genetics as opposed to a generation. Because we always think of a generation as like somebody that's your age that was born near your age, die near your age, generation. Anyways, so Yahshua says that um, the Queen of Sheba was going to judge those people he's talking to. Because he said that she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And then they try to tell us that Sheba is somewhere down here at the bottom of uh, Saudi Arabia. I would think if anybody actually knew the proper geography of the earth, it would be the only born son of the living God. But apparently he thinks this is the ends of the earth. Now, I'm not going to stop there. I got one better for you. They're not going to let me go. Okay, that's as close as they're going to let me go. But you're all right. You can see. So, in uh, 1 Kings, there in, I believe it's chapter 4. And same with Chronicles. You'll find it in 1 Chronicles, I believe, the parallel account. It says that King Hiram, and now they try to tell us that... Uh, Tyr and Sidon, or Tyr and Sidon, who were up in this area here, okay? Now, it says that uh, King Hiram assisted Shalmei, who they call Solomon, in building a navy. And what they do is they give this area here which is supposed to be Edom and Sire, that he built a navy on the Red Sea. That's what they say. That's in the translations, okay? They, down in the sea here. It says that the ships that they built, and we will see this with later kings, build ships specifically to go and do trade with a place called Thershish. They like going to Thershish. There's a lot of stuff in Thershish. And there was a lot of trade for a long, long time with Thershish. Now, were they bringing back gold and silver and monkeys and peacocks? I don't know if it was monkeys and peacocks, and neither do they. Those are some of the words that we have problems with the lexicography of. So, um, but it was every three years the ships would come back from Thershish. And the navy was supposed to be here. Where is Thershish? I don't know. I promise you, I don't know. But here's a head-scratcher for you. 
in the book of Jonah, when Yahweh tells Jonah that I want you to go and prophesy to Nineveh, it's uh, Nineveh, actually, Nineveh. Now Jonah realizes immediately, he knows how kind and merciful Yahweh is. He knows. And that bothers him to no end, because obviously Jonah does not want to see this city or these people saved. There's reasons for that before you judge Jonah too harshly. And he went through enough. Let's leave him alone. But what he does in order to thwart the will of Yahweh, which is insane enough, but it says that he goes to Joppa and boards a ship to Tarshish. Now I want you to remember that. Think about this for a second. We know for a fact, if, if this is the right map, remember, okay, that's the assumption, if this is the right map, and this is where everything is going on at, right here, that's the assumption. Then we have two factors. One fact is that Hiram and Shalmay built a navy, most specifically to go to Thershish in the Red Sea, right? That's what we're told. Now, and then we're told that uh, Jonah, in order to get out of going to Nineveh, Nineveh, to prophesy, that he goes to Joppa and boards a ship headed to Thershish. Now, the Joppa of today is located on the coast of the Mediterranean. Shalmay's navy was supposed to be down here in this arm of the Red Sea. And do we see the problem? Well, I'm going to tell you what the problems are. The problems are, I'm going to zoom out now. And it still doesn't give me a big full map. So, um, I'll, just, I'll just go to Google Maps, okay? And um, get a map of the so-called world. There we go. It doesn't matter. We could go to an old map if you want. That one looks really cool, doesn't it? Can I get, uh, can I get a nice big picture of that? Big enough. Big enough. <laughs> so they say that this is what they think the world looked like at one time. Maybe. I'm open. I'm game. So, um, let's think about this, right? It is said, and I believe it, it's in the Bible, it's said, because this is the, the land of promise. Remember, folks, the land of promise was to, if this is the right location, okay, was supposed to go from this coast here all the way to the Parath, and they tell us that's the Euphrates, the Parath. Well, that's amazing to me because they're going to be encroaching big time on some empires that are supposed to be very old and well entrenched, like the Kajdim Empire. You know, who knows what kind of an empire Haran is at the time? So it doesn't matter where you're going with this border, you're encroaching on another kingdom, another empire. But hey, Let's just suspend that for a minute. And we'll say, okay, you know, his so his empire, Shalmay's, Solomon's, goes to the Parath, which they tell us is the Euphrates. Well, if that's the case, and it does go to Parath, the Euphrates, that empties out into the Persian Gulf. Now, I'm not a sailor, but I would think that exiting from the Parath to the Persian Gulf, which is where it empties, would be a lot faster getting to this Thershish place 
than being up here in the eastern arm of the Red Sea. That would be my assumption. <clears throat> but let's just say that his navy was in the eastern arm of the Red Sea. Now, you got to remember, his western border is supposed to be here along the Mediterranean. Uh, that's where Joppa is. That's where we're told it is today. So, Chalmay's got a navy in the east arm of the Red Sea. And this navy is going to this place, Thershish, and getting all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. Now, I don't know exactly what he's using to trade since half of Palestine would be desert and everything east of it's desert and everything south of it's desert. And apparently, Haram and others would be occupying Lebanon to the north. So I'm not sure what he's trading. But anyways, they're going to some place, Tharshish, and it's a three-year deal. Three years. Now, some people might be able to reconcile the problem with Shalmay's navy being on the east side of the Red Sea to go to Tharshish, and Jonah boarding a ship in Joppa in the Mediterranean going to Tharshish. They may reconcile this by saying, well, Tharshish must be somewhere along this coast of Africa. It's a three-year round trip, folks. Three-year round trip. It doesn't say that they stopped off in the Caribbean for a vacation in the middle of this. They were merchants. They were merchant marines. They were getting there. They were trading. Nobody says they were doing the mining themselves. They were going there to trade. They would sail their ships to Thershish. They would trade. They would come back. Three years. I'm saying there's no way. It's along the coast of Africa. Sorry. Sorry. I'm not seeing those kind of times. Maybe I'm just not smart. Three years, man. So, if it's three years, it would have to be him going in that direction from this east arm of the Red Sea. It'd have to be going in this direction here. That being the case, I just got to tell you, I think any mariner that's headed out of Joppa to go over here, um, boy, I don't get it. I mean, I guess that could have been a stop, right, along the way, but I don't know who would book passage on a ship over here to go to some place way over here. That'd be a, that'd be a long trip. Really, really long trip with a lot of stops, I would think. Doesn't settle well. Not for me, it doesn't. And if Jonah leaves out of the, uh, the Mediterranean, and um, he's going to this place, Thershish. They experience a storm, a sea monster. I don't think it's a fish. I would have to say it was some kind of a great uh, sea serpent. And I don't have Jonah up right now, so I'm not going to go to that. Anyways, swallows him. Now, it says, it doesn't say he was thrown up onto the banks of Nineveh or anything like that. It says he was, the, the, the sea creature throws him up onto dry land. And then it says that he began to go into Nineveh 
an exceedingly great city that was three days journey now because of the syntax it's hard to work out what that means but it says that he goes he went into it a day's journey and that's when he starts proclaiming that it's going to be ruined by Yahweh if they don't repent I'll zoom back in on this map for a minute okay remember <clears throat> Nineveh or Nineveh is supposed to be near Mosul here you see <laughs> unless that sea creature also had wings and flew really well it's gonna have a problem getting here now anybody who wants to deal with that by saying well it was a miracle okay well first off the Bible doesn't say it was a miracle Bible simply says that this sea creature threw Jonah up onto dry land and he proceeded to go to Nineveh wherever it was he was thrown up we get the impression from the text that it's not far from Nineveh and that's that's nowhere you can get from here it's not gonna happen and you you can't get over here and swim upstream and do it in three days Now, there would be merchants that would probably have to port here. And let's say that their goal was Thershish. And wherever it is, it is far, far, far away from this place. If it's closer to get to Thershish from the uh, the Mediterranean port, why didn't Shelmay just put his ships there? If not, why didn't Jonah board a ship elsewhere, down here? <laughs> Can't say for sure. A lot of things happened territory was uh, was taken and, and reclaimed by uh, let's say uh, Edom if this is really where Edom's supposed to be a place where really no one wants to live but that's where the Dukes of Edom were Edom was a quite a, a powerful empire of people the Dukes of Edom living in these rocks in the desert If Tharshish is this way, over to the east, and Shalmei had this empire that stretched to the Euphrates, well then certainly he would have to have a piece of uh, real estate here around Kuwait, somewhere where he could get into the Persian Gulf. Why not put a navy there? Well, you could say, well, because <clears throat> this is just closer to the land proper, dummy. So, of course, the Navy's going to be there because of the sailing and everything. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. You know, he's if it's here, they've got to go all the way, you know. But maybe that's better. Could be. I'm not sure. Maybe it would just be better to station a Navy here than over here. Because this is, after all, just total wasteland desert. 
This is the place they try to tell us is, is Kush, this wasteland here, where there's nothing. Funny enough, though, Kush is mentioned quite frequently as being uh, bordering on Metzurim, which they tell us is Egypt. So then you'll find that there has to be two Kushes, guys, because they need one Kush to be bordering on Egypt, but they need another Kush to be where it's supposed to be, over in the middle of the desert. Doesn't add up. None of it adds up. It's a big world we live in. It's a big world. There's a lot of land. There's a lot of bodies of water. There's a lot of wilderness. There's a lot of arable land and lush places. And of all the pieces of land in all the world that our God, who is absolutely good and wise and honest, he calls this land a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, and vines, and fig trees, and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. I don't know if pomegranates is right or not. Remember, unknown lexicography. Same with a lot of fruits and stuff, okay? But obviously, it's good stuff. It's stuff where a lot of things are growing. It's a land of plenty, a land wherein you shall eat bread without scarceness. I don't know of anybody that would describe this place like that. Now remember, today they say that Greater Palestine, including uh, the Jew and the Arab, sustains itself. And it's about four million people. David and Solomon's empire, far bigger. And we haven't even counted all of the nations and peoples living in and around them all over. How does a place that's 50% desert sustain all those people? And what does Shalmay have to trade with Tharshish that's going to bring him back gold and silver? monkeys and peacocks, if that's even correct. What has he got to trade? What does he have to trade? You have to trade. Is, is he just going to go to um, Thershish and steal? Was Thershish a place that no one lived? And so they had to go and find this stuff. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense either. They'd be gone for a whole lot longer if they were going to, to find things. Sounds to me like regular trade. So that's it. That's it. That's what I got. Uh, that's not all I have. There's a whole lot more. It's all over the place. Uh, if you just pay attention and you look at the underlying words that they have purposely translated to be words that sound like these places. But nothing fits when you start looking at it um, objectively under a magnifying glass we got to go somewhere else and I don't know where I'm not offering that answer because I don't know where okay because there's there's so many relatively national 
I'm sorry, natural uh, landmarks and various formations uh, that could make this work. It could work in Europe. It could work in, uh, in the UK. It could work in America. It could work in a lot of places. Only a few things that need to be specific. But everything else, we've, we've got those sorts of land formations and everything just, you know, all over the place. And what's this deal with all of the, uh, they say, Egyptian artifacts in the Grand Canyon? What's this deal about Alexander the Great and supposedly the Ptolemies' um, tombs being found in Burroughs Cave in Illinois? What is this about the, the largest city that they know, largest ancient city that they know of recorded um, based on uh, its boundaries being near St. Louis on the Mississippi. Why do they keep covering up sites in America? You can't get to them, man. The, the Department of the Interior, as soon as they know about a site that seems important to them, it's off limits, and nobody's going to be going there. Nobody's going to be talking about it either. Why have the Smithsonian worked tirelessly to... Um, cover up all of the finds uh, right near me, Walkerton, Indiana. Giants found, eight and nine foot giants, clothed in armor of brass. Sounds like Goliath's armor, right? Sounds like the armor of a hoplite. Hmm. Things to think about and consider. I don't know how soon I'll be making another video, but I sincerely thank everybody for sending me links and leads, giving me encouragement. The thing that I appreciate the most, honestly, quite honestly, is the prayer for me. Because I, I depend on having the work from our Father so that I can, I can do this. I don't want to have to worry about supporting my family or finances, you know? So the work is what I always need. So that's why I always ask. Just pray for me, if you would. I, I do appreciate it that I can stay in health enough to do these things and support my family like a man should. Um, and I'd be very grateful. You know, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. So until next time, everybody, take care of yourself, take care of your neighbor. 